let's see, Big Son Mesh, uh, not, I'm not really sure where we are with Big Son Mesh. We've had a couple of new, we, we had a, a long-standing issue that got fixed. We're hoping that was the last thing. Uh, but we've had a couple of other smaller issues show up during, uh, during testing. These all have to do with appearance during local edit. When you're in the middle of editing your own appearance, uh, some of the things don't resolve quite the same way as they do other times, um, uh, particularly for texturing of uh, non-rigged meshes with bakes. Um, it seems like kind of a corner case. I don't know how often you'd want to rig a non-rigged mesh with a bake, but uh, there may be there may be other issues, but those are the ones that I'm currently aware of. Um, so anyway, we've got a meeting to review all of this stuff tomorrow. Try to figure out where we are. Um, there were some questions about the behavior of bakes when you were doing um, transparent textures. Uh, basically, the only way we can get a transparent texture is to use one of the aux channels because they don't have a uh, transparent skin texture underneath. And I think people had different expectations about what was going to happen when you... So the cases that we are trying to support now are, one, if, if you want the aux channel to actually be opaque, the way to do it is to put an opaque, you know, put a wearable with an opaque texture at the bottom of your stack. That means you you need a, a universal that had something skin-like underneath you. And then you would also set um, set the uh, uh, alpha blending to none, uh, or the, the alpha mode to none for the for the mesh. Um, the other case people were interested in was, okay, what if you just got some translucent texture, like a tattoo or something, and then you actually want to be punching holes in the model, um, you know, having having portions of it be sort of see-through. Uh, and the case that we think works there is if you uh, universal wearable that just has transparent textures, and then you set the alpha mode to alpha blending on the model, then uh, that, that seems to work correctly as well. Um, it is possible to combine, have combinations of textures and uh, alpha settings that give screwy results that probably isn't what anybody wants. So um, part of what we want to do to get this out is to uh, actually document this stuff a little bit or in post so draft describe this stuff. Uh, Let's see. So that's it for Bakes on Mesh. I uh, hope we'll have more definitive I, information next week. Can I jump in on Bakes on Mesh? Oh, Kyle, Kyle asked me to you know, give a warning that Bakes on Mesh, uh, you know, depending on the, the review that Beer was talking about, um, if, if those are just corner cases, then Bakes on Mesh may be shipping very soon. So if you have any bugs with Bakes on Mesh, please get them into JIRA right away. Yeah, this is this is a good time for people to jump in and, and do testing on the RC if they haven't looked at it for a while. Ah, let's see what else. Uh, so Animesh two, the Project Muscadine, that is. Coming along, I'm trying to get a project viewer assembled for that. Um, so we've been having some design discussions around the new LSL functions that let you set uh, visual params for, for animeshes. Um, so we, in, in the process of that, we, we flagged a couple of things we want to change. One, one thing I, I think I told everybody is that uh, we're going to allow specifying the params by either strings or uh, numeric IDs. And, of course, that's kind of inconsistent with the way that we specify anything. Basically, we use, uh, we use constants for that sort of thing. So that is what we're going to 
do is change it so that we've got a set of constants that define all of the you know, currently supported uh, visual param sliders. And uh, the normal usage then would be to use one of those constants. If you really want to specify it by a number instead, I guess there's nothing to Uh, let's see, so, oh, sorry, um, let's see, Bakes on Mesh for Animesh 2, probably not, we, uh, we may do that at some point, um, but I think if we do, it's probably going to come out later than, uh, than this current project. Uh, can anybody else hear me, or am I breaking up for everybody? Okay, well, I'll uh, try to speak up, but I don't know what else I can do about it. Uh, attachment points uh, probably are going to be something we look at fairly soon. They're they're uh, more likely to be tackled for this project than the uh, the bakes on Animesh. Of course, if we don't even have uh, bakes on mesh shipped yet, it makes it hard to build additional features on top of it. Um, so it's it's probably going to depend on the timing of that, probably. Uh, let's see, so I think that's it for, um, I think that's it for Animesh 2. I'm, uh, I'm hoping to get that out soon, uh, but of course it needs to go through the usual testing and still uh, doing some internal documentation about that as well. So, uh, again, we'll keep you posted. Um, I don't know, that's all I can think of for, uh, kind of updates right now. Dan, can you think of anything else? Um, <clears throat> sorry, I just took a bite of food. Um, we, uh, well, we just got a new e-viewer out this last week. Um, it's um, a couple steps in the right direction. We still have a lot more testing to do. And, uh, yeah, any help, any, any bugs you see there, please enter them. Um, that's all. Yeah, I haven't looked at Heap for a while, but it uh, sounds like it's uh, getting nice. Yeah, uh, Lucy, I saw you filed a bug about uh, the throttle, um, and I'm, you know, I'm interested in discussing what the use cases are that you're shooting for. Um, you know, we we might tweak the exact throttle. We're trying to avoid the, you know canonical use it to do animations at 60 frames per second scenario, which is kind of what we assume that a lot of people are going to try to do if we don't have a throttle. Um, but what what kind of frequency would you foresee being normal for the, for the cases you're trying to support? What kind of game applications are you thinking of? I mean, you know, I was originally envisioning the visual param stuff being more like, um, you know, you've got a set of different customizations you can have, and so you've got your, I don't know, you've, you've got your fireman model, and you can set it to sexy fireman or skinny fireman or chubby fireman, and it gets, you know, it, it, when you do that, it sets a, a set of visual params. Um, but presumably with that sort of thing, you're not going to be doing it with a high rate of frequency. OK. 
Character growing in size with power-ups. Huh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, a anyway, we don't, uh, we don't have a final answer to the throttle. I mean, it isn't even officially released for testing yet, although I, I appreciate the initiative of people who managed to test it anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely have more documentation and more discussions about that once we have uh, an actual project viewer out. Um, let's see, viewer impact tests, not yet. It's, you know, that's the sort of thing where we need to have a uh, region with a lot of these things and, you know, they're all sort of frantically spamming out their updates and we see at what point it's a real problem. Uh, I think currently there's a built-in throttle on the simulator in terms of how many of those updates get sent out. So um, you're, we're probably going to run into that before we actually run into rates that are uh, clobbering performance. So anyway, as we get further into the development process, we'll Yeah, uh, you know, obviously, if you're talking about what rate is a problem, it depends on how many uh, how many objects are getting updated. If you've got, you know, one object in the scene that's updating once a second, it's probably fine. If you've got 200 objects in the scene that are all updating once a second, then dissipating that would be more likely to cause problems. But uh, as I say, we don't really have the numbers on that yet. Working on getting a view as soon as you can. Uh, I see there's a mention about a function in EAP that looks like a frame rate killer. Uh, if you're seeing a change in behavior there, it would be good to file a JIRA, uh, Teresa. Yeah, somebody filed that, I think. Okay, good. I think it was Teresa. Uh, Animats asks uh, about making the physics model bigger. Uh, the physics model should be something you can set, uh, you know, independently, but I'm not sure if that's what's actually determining the ability to click on things. I think it may have more to do with um, the settings we have for, for rigged meshes versus, uh, versus static prims. Um, that, that's been an issue with Animesh for a while now. It's not, I don't think it's specific to this project, but uh, that, that is on the list of things I want to take a look at uh, while we're working on this stuff. Yeah, I mean, basically doing, doing collision detection on rigged meshes is harder because they're getting updated all the time, right? People are constantly moving or the Animeshes are constantly moving. Um, so uh, allowing kind of real time clicking on the have a uh, it. So if some of that stuff isn't working currently, that's that's probably the uh, reason it's set that way. If we wanted to change it, we'd have to do some testing to make sure it didn't break something else. Yeah. So I was just saying if you link it to a prim, but if you do that, then it's it's just the prim that's easy to click on, not the actual rig meshes, right? Yeah, right-click touch does, does work for me now. Hmm, the cube a few meters away case sounds odd. We should take a look at that. Uh, 
Uh, Lucy, you asked about changes to the behavior of functions. I think it's, I think the main changes we're looking at right now are just name changes and, um, you know, taking those, those constant parameters instead of strings. And uh, we may generalize it so that, like, the name doesn't specify that it takes visual params because we might want to, you know, keep the possibility of adding other types of customization kind of under the same command at some point. But, um, yeah, in terms of the kind of stuff you can do with it, it's it's probably pretty much the same as what we've been talking about, you know, at least at least as of right now. Uh, uh, the touch stuff is, is just viewer side calculations. I mean, when you're just clicking on the scene and it's trying to figure out whether it's uh, hitting something. Uh, question about dropping mesh from attached. Uh, don't think anything's changed there. It's um, that's really blocked on simulator side work. Um, it's needed to do the right kind of updates when uh, a rigged object gets dropped. So that's been blocked for a long time, kind of pending somebody having the chance to to make those changes. That's also on the list of things I'm hoping to look at for this project, but uh, I'm not I'm not promising anything about it. Uh, Lucy, I'm not sure what you mean by string type casted integer inputs. You mean like actually writing an integer as a string, you know, quote, 33, end quote, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would definitely not be consistent with anything we're doing now. Lucy, you mean you're actually using CSV content inside your your LSL script and then having to convert it on the fly?
Do you have a CSV data that you're pulling in from somewhere else rather than having it actually be like embedded inside the script? Yeah, well, uh, you know, if it turns out that a lot of people are trying to do that kind of thing, um, you know, we could talk about it, but uh, it's, you know, we are trying to have the different LSL functions work in a fairly consistent way, so it would it would probably be something where, you know, we'd either be talking about sort of changing the handling of that sort of quoted integers in a lot of places or, uh, you know, just, uh, just keeping it the way it is. Probably more likely it would keep it the way it is, though. If anyone wants to claim that LSL is not uh, consistent with all of the capabilities of the best current languages, I'm probably not going to argue. Uh, no, we don't have any docs on the Animesh 2 stuff yet. Uh, just We're trying to get the viewer in a suitable state to be a project viewer and get the um, get the functionality for the for the visual param manipulation in what we hope is the right state. Um, once it is actually ready for public testing, then we will write up some docs on it. And I'll, uh, I'll definitely mention that at the uh, meetings here. Yeah, uh, Lucy, those, those constants uh, will exist before that.
Yeah, uh, Lucy, I'm not sure you even mean by media storage. Are you using like a URL that references a local file or something like that? Putting that data in the media URL of the prim. Uh, yeah, well, if that's not currently broken, I'm certainly not promising that it's not going to become broken in the future. Let's say it's not a supported use case. So basically the problem you're trying to solve is that you want to be able to get to large amounts of data that it's not efficient or possible to, to embed in the LSL itself. What, what kind of scale are we talking about here? So it, it would actually be possible to store the data on a server somewhere and then grab it via HTTP, is that right? Realizing that that would require you to be managing a server, which would be a added hassle, yeah. If you could store some amount of data inside objects, would that be one option? I mean, I'm not promising anything here. I'm just thinking out loud. Is most of this stuff that is kind of logically associated with a particular object anyway? So the amount of data you're trying to store is something like a few K up, 
how how often are you going to need to uh you know retrieve it or modify it How many params are you using, like 80, 80 odd, something like that? Okay. There were 112 useful ones. I came up with somewhat shorter list in the in the bento skeleton page. Those are the ones that actually affect bones and collision volumes. Yeah, I think you're going to have some that are morphs and some that are, you know, sort of texture properties like skin color, or eye color, which we don't really have any mechanism to use currently either. One entertaining thing I discovered this week is that there's actually a duplicate param. It's like torso muscles is in there twice under two different numbers. I have no idea why. Yeah, there may be others. That's the only one that turned up when I was converting the uh, bone and collision volume munging ones. Yeah, pretty much any change is going to update something on the asset servers. Except for changes to stuff that lives in the um, lives in the inventory item, like if you change the name of an item, that's an inventory property, but if you change, you know, a slider value or something, then that's changing an asset. Yeah, we are planning to look into using, you know, supporting using shapes to specify a bundle of params all together, but it's not working currently.
Yeah, trying to actually break up the shape is, a, is definitely a harder problem. Um, but at least having a separate, uh, you know, get set command gives you some mechanism to, to override those if you want. Uh, Adam, you asked about uh, about list plus equals item. Uh, I don't have any idea whether Mono does that efficiently or not. Shape settings in the XML export, I think they're ordered by ID, aren't they? Sorry, so I don't think I'm getting context. Uh, people trying to save inventory folders into nested prims. Um, I know that's possible, though it's kind of risky. Um, but what what is this? What is this about the uh, name change thing? Oh, you mean the the feature that lets you actually change your uh, your avatar's name? Uh, risky. I, I think the main risk is just if you leave stuff in a region, right? If you you can have a region crash and and lose uh, lose contents. Um, if you're pulling it into inventory, I guess it'll work okay. I don't know. I haven't, uh, haven't really tested it much. Um, okay, so... Okay, so we've got these nested inventory things. Now there's a question about user changing the name. Um, I'm not sure how those are connected. It, you know, changing your name shouldn't affect your inventory in any way. It's just a... Um, Uh, it's it's just a uh, you know additional piece of data that's associated with your you know agent ID. Yeah, not really. Ouch! That sounds really painful. I mean, okay, you're going to say that the other inventory is painful too. I can't argue with you too much. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the biggest risk would be if you, you know, you've got some box sitting in your region and it has the sim state hasn't been backed up yet, and you know it crashes and you lose your thing. Um, if it's an inventory or it's been there for ages, and so the sim state's already been backed up, then probably not as a big concern. Oh, 
anyway, so I hope that the nested uh, objects thing isn't affected in any way by the name change thing, but uh, if, if there is some way that that could have an effect, then that's something we should look at. So yeah, as soon as I can swing it, probably not tomorrow though. A few other things going on, including the uh, bakes on mesh stuff. All right, well, I guess we might as well wrap it up. We're about at time here. Um, let's see, so we have a meeting next week. Uh, I'm not sure what's gonna happen in two weeks because we've got this summit where people are gonna be traveling a lot. Um, but I think the timing will work out in such a way that I'll be around in time to do the meeting anyway. Um, just need to double check that. Uh, you want it right away or you want it with attachment points? All right, well, I'll talk to everybody next week then. Have a good one. Awesome, thanks, Bear. Thanks, Lyndon. Bye, Kelly. Everyone.